Okay, great. So uh, welcome everybody uh, to uh, this panel on sustainable cities and communities as part of the Trust for Sustainable Living's 10 year anniversary celebration of its international essay competition. And we're really delighted to have so many of you uh, watching uh, today and joining us, uh, not just on uh, Zoom, but also on Facebook Live. And you're extremely welcome. And we're really excited about a very interesting conversation that we're going to have with our panelists today. And I'll uh, give you a little bit of background on the panelists and then we'll go to a video uh, that we're going to show you and then we'll start our discussion. Uh, my name's James Close. I'm uh, a trustee of the Trust for Sustainable Living. And my day job is to run the Circular Economy Program uh, for London, helping London become a leading low carbon circular city uh, and prior to uh, joining uh, uh, that role I was the director of climate change of the World Bank working internationally on uh, so it's great to have so many people from so many different countries joining us for this conversation and today we have joining us uh, Bernard Coombs who's uh, the um, uh, it works in the uh, on education for sustainable development uh, at UNESCO. So we're very uh, pleased to welcome you, Bernard. And we've also got Dan Jones, who's the director of public realm at the London Borough of Tower Hamlets, and he's chair of the London Environment Directors Network. So welcome to you, Dan. And Dan and I work closely together in our current jobs. And uh, really pleased to have Luis Alvaro with us from Sao Paulo in Brazil. Uh, Luis is the International Relations Secretary uh, for the city and uh, he's, uh, uh, I know you're in for a real treat listening to him talk about some of the amazing things San Paolo is doing. Um, we also have uh, Travis uh, who is a digital sustainable living. Uh, and we're really uh, sorry but at very short notice, uh, Katian Rocha who was our youth uh, voice uh, was unable to join us because of a family emergency and we really uh, wish uh, Katian uh, well and we're really sorry that we haven't got the voice of youth uh, on this uh, conversation so uh, hopefully through your questions you'll be able to represent your opinions and uh, views and uh, we look forward to taking some questions at the end of, uh, uh, of the discussions that we're going to have. So I think, uh, Eva, uh, over to you to queue up the video uh, from UNEP and uh, we'll have a, a few minutes watching that. So if you bear with us a moment, we'll get that uh, up and running. Hi, my name is Sam Barrett from UN Environment. Um, I think there's so much that schools and teachers can do to make a real difference when it comes to climate change and the environment. The things that we eat, the houses that we live in, how we travel, is 75% of our own individual carbon footprint. So really thinking about um, how do you get around? Uh, what do you have in the canteen to eat? Uh, how well insulated is the, is the school will make a huge difference. But then taking that message home is where it can really land. and. We have done a lot of work with the Scouts and the Girl Guides around plastics with the Tide Turners badge that's been taken on by 200,000 kids. Uh, and we really want to do as much as we can with youth, whether it's with the video gaming industry or working with universities to really kind of move this agenda forward or with the Earth School, uh, which we've done with TED. Um, we're aware that only 4% of the kids in the UK feel they know enough about climate change. So what we teach is how the future emerges. And so we really de need to reassess the curriculum that we're currently offering to children and just working out if it is doing what we have to do for climate change. So uh, to all of you out there uh, who've taken part uh, in the competition with TSL, well done. And uh, thank you on behalf of everyone at UN Environment for the work that you do. And uh, we're happy to work with you further if that's useful. Uh, and uh, thank you for giving us this opportunity to address Great. Well, thank you. Uh, thanks to Sam uh, for that message. Uh, 
encouragement and um, it's quite uh, encouraging in some ways to know that only 5% of uh, UK pupils feel as though they know enough about climate change. So uh, I think it's uh, beholden to all of us to uh, help uh, inform as many people as we possibly can. Um, so uh, from that uh, introduction, um, I would like to turn to Bernard. Uh, and Bernard, I think you've got some introductory remarks for us. Uh, over to you. Hello. Hello, everyone. Uh, so I'm, I'm Bernard Combe. I'm from uh, UNESCO in Paris. I work on education for sustainable development and I also work on cities, cities and communities. So you're probably all wondering, you know, why, why talk about education in cities? I would say, well, for us, education is uh, lifelong. It can take place anywhere, not just in schools. It can take place outside, in the street and, and around. Uh, we've just launched a new program for the next 10 years called Education for, Twi Education for Sustainable Development for 2030. And we have five priority areas in there. And those five priority areas concern also cities and communities. I'll just very quickly go through those. The first one is about policy. Um, in education, you need to talk about sustainability issues. And in sustainability, um, plans, you need to include education that applies to cities just as well as gov national governments or um, country governments. Um, what does that mean? It means that the, your education program within a city needs to talk about climate change, biodiversity, food, water within your schools, but it also means that within your <coughs> city planning and policies, you need to integrate the fact that you the schools are there and the schools need to be able to have access to nature, to be able to have access to other stakeholders in community. The second area of um, focus is on the learning environment. How do you learn? Where do you learn? Unfortunately, many schools within cities are terrible for climate. Uh, instead of having a schoolyard with trees and, and grass, you have just concrete, which is just so bad. Luckily, many cities around the world are changing that. The third one is about um, training, training teachers, training uh, people who work in NGOs that help uh, citizens learn better. So it's uh, about providing tools, ideas. For example, the program Sam was talking about, the Earth School is something we've worked on with, uh, with UNEP to provide uh, materials for, to discuss these issues. Fourth area is of course, the imp most important one we see, it's about mobilizing young people, making sure young people can participate in, in city life and participate in discussions on sustainability issues and making sure that they can actually, their voice is heard and can be taken into account. Uh, luckily for us, a number of cities around the world within their municipal government have seats for young people to contribute to the discussions and decide on what the city will be doing. And finally, the, four, the fifth area is about accelerating sustainable solutions at the local level, meaning how do we tackle the issue of climate, the issue of loss of biodiversity, the issue of uh, water within our cities. Uh, the COVID pandemic has shown us that Cities that have green spaces, people were a bit less stressed by the lockdown, even though they couldn't get out, but they could at least see nature. Um, we've also seen a, a, a growth of urban agriculture. That's also something at local level, we have to reinforce these networking ties. And so for us, in terms of educating, educating is not just for schools, it's for anyone. Any one of us can be an educator and that we have to do things together from different perspectives. So that this is a very quick intro to some of our thinkings about education, learning, and communities, schools. So, so I think we've lost Bernard there. We'll give Bernard just a moment to see if we can get him back again. Yeah, I'm Bernard. Back. Yeah. Oh, great. Thank you very much. Yeah. So that that was my intro. <laughs> great. Very good. Well, look, 
thank you everybody for it's always a, a, a miracle really that we get these webinars and uh, presentations to work so effectively and particularly when we're joining people up from so many different places we've got brazil france canada as well as the uk uh, all represented so um uh, we should always uh, celebrate the, the fact that this uh, usually works more often than it doesn't so i really hiccup please just bear with us uh, but bernard thank you for those comments i mean i think putting uh, the focus of education at the heart of what we do in cities and in terms of local sustainable solutions is uh, really important and i know the work that unesco does is uh, really enriching uh, in this area so we thank you for that and we thank you for those opening uh, comments so next up I'd like to invite uh, Luis uh, Alvaro, Secretary Luis Alvaro, uh, to uh, make uh, his uh, opening comments. Luis, uh, can you uh, can you join us, please? Can you hear me well? We can hear you well, Luis. Okay, great. Hope my São Paulo internet does not make me disappear for a while. So. Good morning, James. We had the, met, the, the pleasure to meet during the Circular Economy London Week. And good morning to my colleagues here, even being on a very cold morning here in Sao Paulo today. Uh, the first thing to know about the city of Sao Paulo is that it is a city with global dimensions. So although similar to other big cities such as London and New York, in Sao Paulo, urban challenges take up a much wider scale and complexity due to its dimensions and historical inequalities. Sao Paulo has 12 million inhabitants. Uh, re we reach almost 20 million in the metropolitan area. And we have one of the biggest bus fleets in the world, around 14,000 vehicles that transport 10 million people every day, just like an example. The municipality is responsible for almost 1 million students between kindergarten and 14 years old, which totals 2,300,000 meals offered every day. The city has 880 producers markets uh, held weekly, 23,000 restaurants throughout the city, and one third of Sao Paulo's territory is classified as rural. Sao Paulo is in a very special place when we consider the national context. It is the largest urban center in the country, the national capital for tourism, for technology, for cultural activities, gastronomy, education, and even for politics. The city is a, a laboratory for good practices. Uh, what we implement here in Sao Paulo has a huge impact on the metropolitan region, on the state of Sao Paulo, and also serves an as an example to other cities in Brazil facing similar challenges. Due to all of these numbers, Food security and sustainability have naturally always been an important topic for the municipal government. We found uh, in the concept of circular economy a way to address the challenges in transforming the way we produce, the way we consume, and the way we discard food, consequently affecting our environment and sustainability. To help us to transit into a circular economy model, we have a very important partnership with the Ellen McCartan Foundation, with whom we have been working to decrease the use of plastics in the city and to implement the food initiative. So to fight the use of plastics, Mayor Bruno Covas signed in 2019 the new Plastics Economy Global Commitment with the goal to promote ambitious policies for the use of recyclable, reusable and compostable plastic. Also last year, uh, Mayor Brunkova signed a law that prohibits the local establishments of offering plastic straws. And in January 2020, another law that prohibits the distribution of single-use plastics such as cups, plates, and cutlery. Local establishments will have until January 2021 to adapt as not to offer or sell any single-use plastic. Uh, regarding the food initiative in July 2019, Sao Paulo was announced as one of the three flagship cities of the food initiative, uh, together with London and New York. The initiative is built around three ambitions, food grown locally and regeneratively, where appropriate, uh, reduce food waste, and design a market healthier food. 
Uh, to achieve these ambitions, we are articulating the private sector, the public sector, and the organized civil society in order to rethink how we produce, how we distribute food, and how we treat solid waste. The initiative supports us by articulating and strengthening public policies and programs that support and strengthen local organic farmers, produce quality food for the population, such as the municipal, food feeding, uh, municipal school feeding program and that address properly the waste generated in the city. We begin with uh, all of these policies for strengthening farming, organic and healthier food. Then we distribute them, fighting hunger and nutrition insecurity. And after it all, we treat the solid waste in a manner that uh, they are not simply discarded, but can be returned to nature in a way you won't disturb the natural uh, cycle of things. Uh, we do have a food bank, which is one of the most important policies we have. Uh, it is a facility for storing food that is no longer being commercialized, but is still fit for human consumption. So we distribute the food to civil society associations that in order, uh, in their turn, they redistribute them as prepared meals or in natura to a vulnerable population. We also have a municipal program on fighting food waste and loss as an important piece of the cycle as it collects fruits and vegetables from those farmers markets and public markets and then send them to the food bank. In order to complete the cycle, the food that can no longer be consumed by the population is sent to one of the five municipal composting facilities we have uh, that it is uh, transformed into composting that is distributed free of charge to the population as well as to farmers, schools, health facilities, public parks, and others. It decreases the amount of solid waste that would usually end up in landfills, emitting less carbon dioxide into the environment. Finally, it is important to highlight the impact of circular economy initiatives in the context of recovering from the coronavirus virus pandemic. So the pandemic has shown us the most terrible consequences of inequality and of our current production model. Circular economy offers us a chance to transform the way we produce and consume in order to prevent these consequences in the future. As an example, recently Mayor Brunukovas took a commitment promoted by the C40, which is an important network of cities, that the economy after the pandemic should not go back to business as usual, but should transition to a more sustainable model. Together with cities such as New York, Boston, Bogota, Hong Kong, Lisbon, London, and Santiago, Sao Paulo is committed to working towards a more resilient and equitable future that is not hurtful to nature and that fights inequalities and social vulnerability. It is for this reason that Mayor Covas and I commend such initiatives from the Ellen McCartan Foundation and events like this one. For governments around the world, this pandemic has truly been a wake-up call that we have to change how we do pol public policies. If, if all, this moment is teaching us that we can do differently, demonstrating the power of a circular and conscious economy. We think it's crucial that we wait no longer. We are the future gener generation that has to build a better future right now. Thank you very much. James, the ball is for you. We lost James. <laughs> yes, thank you very much, Secretary Alvaro. I mean, it, 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 it's, so, it, it, it's so wonderful to, to hear from you again. And, you know, I really think that uh, your description of the integrated way in which food systems work and, uh, around inequality and how you feed those uh, one million uh, students under the age of 14 is really extremely inspiring and we're certainly in London delighted to be working with you on the Alan MacArthur Foundation you know the only regret that I have of having to do these things uh, virtually is we don't get a chance to meet up in person and see at first hand the work that you're doing. Uh, but I have been very lucky uh, to have seen at first hand some of the work that uh, Dan and his team are doing. Uh, and Dan, it'd be great to hear from you about uh, how you see this 
from the point of view of London and uh, what you think uh, some of the uh, issues and challenges are. Over to you, Dan. Thank you, James. Uh, yeah, very interesting theories uh, from the Sun Power perspective. And yeah, and just for Colly uh, on, on, the, on the call and for those listening, I'm in London, UK, um, not the London in Canada that Eva uh, was, was uh, talking to me about before. So I'm in London, UK, um, <laughs> city, capital city of, of the UK. Um, and yes, so we, we are um, obviously a, a world global city. Uh, we've got a population of around 9 million. And interestingly, of that, we're a very young city. So nearly one in four Londoners are under the age of 18. Um, and like many cities in the world, we are an incredibly diverse and vibrant city and has shown how people from different countries, cultures and faiths can live together. Um, but also, like other cities, we face challenges such as deprivation, demands on space and environmental problems such as air quality, climate change and some low recycling rates in certain parts of the city. Young people obviously see and feel the challenges sometimes even more than other age groups. And they recently captured the world's attention by marching in the streets here in London and across the world to demand climate change action. This obviously gave us a clear message that we need to do more uh, to carry on harnessing this energy created by young people. And this pandemic, besides being a major public health crisis, has an impact on London's environment. And it's significantly shifted people's attitudes more towards being pro-environmental uh, and, and leading more sustainable lifestyles. But already we're seeing some of that change as people come out of lockdown and start to perhaps get in their cars, go back to work and start to, to um, cause that more air pollution uh, and, and, and contribute towards climate change. But however, I think this, 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 uh, this is a real opportunity for us to accelerate the transition um, to a more quick and green recovery. Um, and by that, I mean sort of green job creations, retrofitting buildings, tackling fuel poverty. Um, and I think young people and their voice have a really important role to play. Um, we need to empower young people, provide them with skills in a green job and focus on green career development. Many schools make efforts to decarbonize and we feel we work locally with, with schools across London to help them to retrofit their buildings, encouraging walking and cycling to school, ensuring food in school meals is sourced locally and provide facilities to pupils, teachers and school staff to reduce their waste and recycle more wherever possible. And it's amazing to see how, how young people locally in schools in their communities are really taking a lead on this by being eco-champions uh, and, and really holding adults to account in terms of what we should be doing um, to make this planet a more sustainable one. As I said, there's some fantastic and inspiring work being done by young people, not just in the UK and in London, but across the planet. And we see that firsthand in the work that we do locally in boroughs. Um, and only by working together can we all make this difference. So in the London Environment Directors Network, which is basically the key sort of strategic directors for the, the local councils or local um, boroughs in London, um, we're putting plans together in terms of prioritise what the next two years, how we tackle some of these significant changes. And we even recognise how important it is that we engage with young people in developing and delivering those strategies. A report last year that was published in London by L Young Londoners identified that whilst reducing waste and recycling and improving air quality and climate emergency were all concerns to them, the number one recommendation that came out of that that they put forward was to include young people in the development of ideas and in the decision making process. And therefore, what we've done as the London Environment Directors Network, in collaboration with other people, is to try to put young people at the heart of how we develop those initiatives in London. And we're going to be hosting, whether it's virtual or, or, or in, 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 re, re, together, uh, is, a, is a, a gathering of young people across London and give them the opportunity to input into our climate strategy and take action locally and across London. We want to listen to young people, remove the barriers, empower them and work together to create a more sustainable city and world. So thank you for the time uh, it's given me to give a London perspective on, on what we're trying to do at probably quite a high strategic level to engage young people in developing a more sustainable city. And I suppose, James, through this, I would offer, if we can, 
how we then throw that out uh, to, to the world, I suppose. Um, I'm sitting here in my, in my lounge in, in the UK talking to the world. Um, so it, it, it's quite, quite bizarre, actually. But if I can actually uh, harness some of that and how we can work together across this particular flat platform and share some of those things with young people in London through our work, I'd, I'd really welcome the opportunity to do that. So thank you very much for the opportunity. Well, thank you, Dan. Thank you very much. And I mean, uh, it's wonderful to see the work that uh, London's doing to engage young people. And I think the message uh, to our young people who are participating here is make sure you have a voice, make sure you get heard. You know, you heard uh, Dan say that he wants to empower young people uh, to be a part of this transition, to make sure that the jobs are there for decarbonizing uh, the city and uh, that uh, young people can be uh, part of that transition. So I think that's just a really great in invitation. And I think uh, it'd be wonderful to figure out ways to keep this conversation going um, and, and to build the momentum that we have through uh, this really remarkable uh, essay competition that's been going on for 10 years and has built such a great community. Um, so. Travis, you're sitting there listening to these uh, comments from uh, our distinguished uh, uh, presenters. Um, and I just wonder if you can try and draw some themes together uh, and maybe perhaps uh, project your own views of the digital transformation that's going to be required to uh, facilitate uh, what Bernard, Dan and Luis have all been talking about. Over to you, Travis. I think, yeah. There you, go. you can hear me. So yeah, yeah. thanks, James. Uh, so I know I really, really interesting and complimentary uh, comments. And I, I really like how everybody stuck to the time as well, which is not always uh, not always an easy task. So for me, I, I noted um, six common themes. Um, and uh, let's, I think you will all see, see yourselves in, a, in at least, uh, you know, more than one of them. Um, the first one is, is, is education and raising awareness and learning on climate change, sustainability. And I mean, the, the, I'll, I'll add that the, 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 the word that, that now is, is being used uh, more and more is resilience as well. And, and what, that, what sustainability means for resilience uh, uh, in, your, in, your, in your community. So that's the first one. The second, second theme is, uh, which I think is critical, and I, 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 I'm so glad Bernard was, I got to hear firsthand from Bernard about the, the ESD for 2030, which is the second point is, is really goal and objective setting. So setting those targets, whether it's at the town, you know, local, regional, national levels and global levels um, and making sure, making sure of that. Uh, the third one, which we, we, you know, we had some really good uh, uh, examples uh, from Sao Paulo is, and I liked the term, um, you know, best practiced laboratories. So demonstrating best practice laboratories and using the circular economy as a way to address problems like food security, uh, plastic waste, et cetera. Um, the fourth point, which is very near and dear to my, my work in the digital transformation field is uh, the use of, of laws, regulatory, and policy. I mean, this is a this is a key. Um, you know, not just a carrot, not just a stick, uh, not you know, but having an enabler, but also using it as a way to for stakeholders to to you know have a forum and and, and come up with guidelines and 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 ways to do things. Uh, the fifth point, which I, I thought I might hear a little bit more, and I'm sure we could even do a separate session just on that, is climate change in the COVID-19 context. And I think um, I did. I, I did a workshop this morning, uh, a teacher teacher workshop where uh, one of the, there was a question around technology in the COVID nineteen context. And I I, I think I, I, you know the question is is it a, will it be a force multiplier, or will it be a lost opportunity? And I think that's that's uh, to uh, you know to be aware of as we as we go day by day, week by week, but also when we look back uh, a few months down the road. And finally, and I, 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 you know, first, the last but not least, <laughs> is uh, the role of youth, um, and, um, the importance of, of youth. And I, I'll, I'll close that theme with, uh, I know one of the um, 
pillars of the ESD for 2030 framework, which is uh, transformative action. So let's 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 talk about um, the role of youth, especially for transformative action in, in the area of climate change. So James, that's that's how I would I would sum it up. I mean, I can go, I could go on about digital transformation. I think uh, I mean for me, you know, the point number one is uh, make make sure technology is the means, not the end. Um, and then, you know, be very aware of, uh, of the, drivers, I mean, the drivers of, of, of technology and digital transformation, which are going to be mainly in the area of uh, cost saving, efficiency, and um, uh, you know, reporting, monitoring, and uh, improving your, your, your operations, but also in the areas uh, of uh, enablement, which include connectivity, um, and, you know, having adequate energy. Uh, and alternate sources of energy, non-carbon energy, um, regulatory again, and, um, and also the importance of uh, security, data security, and uh, ethics as we as we get more and more into artificial intelligence and um, blockchain. So great! No, thank you, Travis. And uh, let, let's uh, we'll try and pick up some of those themes in the uh, in the questions and answers. And uh, we've got some good questions coming in from uh, participants and, and people who are involved uh, in uh, this conversation. So please do uh, send in your questions and, and uh, I'll, I'll uh, pass those over to the panelists and get them to, uh, to uh, give their views on them. Um, so I'm gonna go uh, back to you, Bernard, uh, first, if I may. Um, I really like the way you talked about uh, the role of education and what you're doing to uh, facilitate uh, that. Um, but how would you, so when you get to 2030 in the work that you're doing um, uh, around uh, the, um, uh, the Education for Sustainable Development agenda, what do you think, what's the outcome that you're expecting? How do you think people will be looking on these topics in a different way? Well, our, our, <laughs> our objective is that people will understand better what these 17 SDGs are about, what's, all, what's it all about. Because currently the problem is that uh, you see documents, you see, uh, I mean, heads of state signing all kinds of things. But for you and I, or anybody on the street, you know, concretely, what does it mean? what does it mean to me that's what the question people are asking and so the i mean the education we're pushing for is a type of education that would help people have basically the skills the tools the values the competencies to be able to deal with this complexity in a way to to make an analogy it's like you're riding a bicycle the chain breaks and you're trying to fix the chain while you're still riding the bicycle. You know, things are getting more and more complex and mm. the world is changing faster and faster. And unfortunately, in basically all countries around the world, the education systems are still set 50 years ago, <laughs> rather mm. than looking forward to 50 years from now. I um, mean, the conversation has started. Um, the COVID the pandemic uh, has given a big kick into the, you know, the, the, the hand ill of education people to say, okay, we have to, we have to move, we have to change. So we hope within the next 10 years that first countries will realize that education cannot be separated from the other sectors of society or sectors of government that it's not, it needs to talk to Ministry of Environment, Ministry of Agriculture and all that, that all these uh, goals that the world sets for itself, you know, 17 SDGs, we are all responsible to try and get to them, even if you, you know, it's a one little thing that you do. Um, one of our former French uh, minister, of environment one time was challenged in parliament saying well you know you keep telling us turn off the light turn off the light you know what is it going to do and she responded well at the time there were 60 million people living in france she said well if you know 60 million little flicks of the switch in the end we'll do something so that's also what we're looking for uh, the other thing we're pushing is that as I said, for us, education is not just in school, it's everywhere. 
it's learning constantly so that we need to push that agenda also um, and we we rely a lot on cities and cities government to do that because we've we've been working UNESCO works with many networks of cities around the world. We have learning cities. We have a learning cities network with nearly 180 cities from all around the world. We also have a network of schools called the UNESCO Associated Schools, 12,000 schools all around the world. And we work with them to help people understand that it's collectively that we can change. And, uh, Again, the COVID has shown us that the time to change is now. It's, let's stop talking, let's start doing. So yeah. that's really what we're pushing for. Great, thank you, thank Bernard. You. And I, I mean, I really uh, take to heart that concept of uh, education uh, for everyone all the time, forever, you know, and I think uh, for all of us, uh, we're constantly learning and that analogy that you uh, describe of fixing your bike uh, chain while you're still cycling is, is a very good one and I think for many of us it feels like we're going through that experience all the time and equipping ourselves with that education and learning uh, can be a real enabler of managing that uh, those challenges so um, and I think also the whole focus on the SDGs the role that the SDGs are currently playing uh, and how they can uh, shape our policy responses uh, is uh, is very interesting and very relevant. Um, so Dan, I'm going to uh, move to you next. Um, uh, as you said at the beginning, London's a leading city. Uh, we have great aspirations for being the leading low carbon circular city. Um, perhaps you can talk a little bit about partnerships and the way in which uh, the relationships between uh, central government, national government, uh, the city government, and then, you know, you're a representative of one of the London boroughs, one of the municipalities. Uh, how do they work and what would be a sort of way in which they could improve over the course of the next uh, 10 years? Right. Thank you, James. Yeah, I think um, we, we here in London have recognised the need to decarbonise faster and more efficiently. And, and recently, London's um, the Environment Director Network showed some pretty good leadership, I believe. And we agreed a number of programmes related to climate ambitions and made a strong commitment to um, support climate action. You know, these, these include things like the home insulation, reducing the use of vehicles, investing in green economic recovery and more. Um, However, I think to make London a real zero carbon city, we need, we need a national effort um, and with the same level of ambition. And we need clear plans and collaboration across all different sectors, not just the local municipalities, but the regional, so for us, the, 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 the London, the mayor, um, and also central government, but also businesses, um, academics, you know, universities, schools, communities, individuals, and obviously, uh, the hot topic, you know, young people as part of that. So no one is an island, you know, we, we can't do this on our own. There has to be a joined up strategy to this. Um, and, there's, and there's clear evidence that a joined strong strategic partnership works. You know, you look at Amsterdam and Copenhagen. I think they're good examples of, of where that is, has been successful. So we need to learn from that uh, 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 in London uh, and how, how they've delivered on that and by joining things up. Um, I think from a local authority perspective, we need clear financial strategies for innovation uh, for climate related projects um, and how we then devise that and deliver those locally, but within a regional and national setting. So we need to work together and part of the London Environment Directors Network it, it, it role is to do that. So to link up with the London Waste and Recycling Board, the General the Assembly, businesses and, and, and parts of government it's been a part of our role to bring all that together. Um, but we need funds from central government to deliver these projects. Um, and I think that's where the role of government uh, is, is evident now in this pandemic uh, and the role of, of, of helping the economy to get back on its feet again. And I'm really pleased with some of the things that's been announced by the government here in London, in the UK, to help with that at the moment. Um, I think to advance uh, perhaps into the next decade, um, we need partnerships and relationships to require shared ownership uh, and they need long term support. So long-term delivery and thinking on this, it can't be short-term. Short-term is no good. We know that. So let's, let's think long-term on how we do this. 
Um, because addressing climate change is a long-term activity, uh, although we only have a small window in which to, to make those important choices. And we need very lasting and close relationships based on collaboration. So I think those are the key things really, James, to make, uh, collaboration is key um, with, with a shared long-term vision. I hope that's okay. Thanks to James there. You've lost James again. James, your mic is off. Oh yeah, James. Yeah, sorry, I beg your pardon. Um, and um, I really, I really love the way you frame that uh, uh, shared ownership and the importance of that as a long-term means of doing um, many of these uh, things. And it was very interesting. Yesterday, we had uh, Tom Rivet Carnock, the uh, podcaster and author, uh, talking about the difference between the short term and the long term. And when we think short term. We often think that many of these things can't get done. But when we think about 10 years time, uh, we think of how fundamentally transformed many of the things that we've seen over the course of the last 10 years have been. So the same rate of progress uh, will continue. So if you think about where we're going to be in 10 years, you really um, help uh, set free that vision of the future and, uh, uh, and that sort of uh, long term approach to making some of this transformational uh, change. Um, and I think, uh, Luis, you know, you've done some amazing work on uh, the food side and food distribution, um, and you link it to inequality, um, and you link it to climate change, um, and you link it to, you know, so many of the things that we've been talking about here today. Um, so why, why are you doing that? And, and in 10 years time, what will it look like in San Paolo? I mean, how will the whole way in which, uh, uh, which uh, this all plays together work? Well, first of all, let's remember that 10 years times, like it sounds like a lot of time, but actually it's not. I mean, especially if you're talking about uh, changing uh, cultural behavior and, and changing the way things are done in, in urban centers like Sao Paulo or London or other city, big cities. So it's not a, a very long time for us to change things. Uh, but food has always been one of the top priorities for the city, for the mayor. Uh, and in terms of public policies, especially if we consider that 30% of the territory of the city of Sao Paulo is still a rural territory with families uh, growing uh, their, their organic food and all. So if you take into consideration the dimensions of the city, of course, food would be an important matter, not only in terms of production, but also in terms of distribution. So in the past years, we have been implementing these policies such as the Connect the Dots, which supports those local farmers. Uh, so we have a, a groundbreaking school feeding policy that introduce organic food into schools. We have composting facilities and, and a successful program for fighting waste and distribution food through the food bank that I already mentioned. So the, compost, the composting facility, uh, among many other different initiatives that we are taking here. So the Alan McCartan Foundation and the Food Initiative came helping us to articulate all of these different policies in a very efficient way bringing together all the relevant uh, actors of the chain and organizations and creating something very strong in terms of governance, helping us to create a vision for the city under the concept of a circular economy. So uh, let's remember we are talking about 10 years, but uh, mayors have a four-year mandate here. So uh, you have to create a very organic systems in terms that the city will remain working with the circular economy, uh, it, it, even if it doesn't matter who won the, who will win the next election. So it's, it has to be important and it has to belong to the city, not to the government. Uh, the strongest achievement we have until this point is that we have successfully brought the to the table the public and the, pri the private sector together. And I think it is safe to affirm that without the support of the private sector, especially of those companies who generate the most waste, it is much harder uh, to tackle the food production and the waste in the city. So we are working to strengthen the local network of restaurants and the waste treatment cycle, discussing the solutions for 
great companies that are in Sao Paulo, so they have options on what they can do with the waste that they're, they're generating. What we have been creating is all of these uh, policies and the food initiative, thinking uh, long-term uh, is a space for us where all of these different actors can discuss the production, consumption, and waste in a, in a proactive way. So circular economy and the way it propels us to rethink how we produce, consume, and distribute food will be the key for a more prepared, uh, a more resilient society for the future. So that is the city we want in 10 years time. Uh, even though uh, we have a four year mandate that we might get it uh, another four year mandate uh, this year, but it has to belong to the city. And that is why it's very important that we bring to the table the private sector and the civil society. Uh, of course, the young, uh, uh, the education uh, so that they can learn that in schools, take that to their homes and become a habit. Because unless it belongs to the city, it won't uh, work for 10, 20, for 30 years long time. Yeah, I mean, some great points there about collaboration, uh, Secretary Alvaro and the role of the private sector um, and, uh, and the city taking ownership for, for, for much of this as well. I've got a very specific question here uh, from Simonette, who I think is uh, in Romania, and she wants to know uh, how you deal with incineration in San Paolo and how you uh, manage to uh, minimize uh, pollution. Um, do, do you want to take that specific question, uh, Luis, while, you, while you're here? Uh, so the, the, the main program we have is the, the composting facilities um, in terms that we can recycle all the organic uh, that is being generated in the city. So uh, we collect them together with the private sector. Um, we collect them from markets. We collect them from, uh, from producers. So it won't be incinerated. It will be, uh, it will be reused uh, for parks and for, for public gardens and all. So we do, we do not incinerate here anymore. Uh, and then the things that can be recycled will go to recycling facilities. And of course, the, Sao Paulo, but Brazil still have the problem of those huge uh, waste landfills that we can see. Um, that is still there. We're trying to solve it. And Sao Paulo, as like the biggest city in the country, has the, the bigger responsibility to try to solve those, but we are not uh, we are not burning trash anymore. We are not doing that. Uh, that's very good to hear. And Simonette, hopefully that answers your question very clearly. And and just to also uh, Bernard to let you know that uh, Simonette's uh, one of the advocates uh, around education, and she's been working on global citizenship education and the preach an appreciation of cultural diversity. And she's very keen to uh, work and collaborate with you. So we'll send you her. Uh, details afterwards and hopefully you can uh, you can connect up and that would be that would be really really great I think um, so uh, I'm going to um, uh, also uh, um, just uh, come back to you uh, Travis now um, and uh, really ask you uh, in terms of your six themes that you've uh, identified raising awareness uh, Golden Objective Seventeen, demonstrating best practice, use of law, policy, and regulation, um, and the climate and COVID nineteen context, uh, and the role of youth uh, for transformative action. Um, do you want to just pick one of those themes and maybe amplify it a little bit for our audience and talk perhaps about uh, again what success would look like uh, as you uh, address that theme? Uh, over a period of say ten years. Okay, I'll take a, I'll take a stab, James. Um, I mean, I think uh, first of all, of course, we're in a we're in an environment where you know there's lots of cross sector and everything is connected to everything, as as some people have said to me before. But um, if I was to take one, I think it's the the best practice uh, laboratories demonstration. I'm 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 fairly field and implementation focused, uh, so. I, I, for me, that would be 
that would be something. And it's about, I mean, it's about, you know, uh, doing a lot of the things that I hear Luis talking about in, in Sao Paulo in terms of having a focused uh, set of what, what some people call wicked problems. Um, and, uh, you know, three, four, five max maybe, and uh, building, building around that um, everything that you need, whether it's, um, um, you know, stakeholders, uh, the right types of forums, the right types of uh, balance between, uh, you know, theory and design and uh, launching, rolling out and implementation. And then um, in terms of the goal setting and, and, and you know, we're measuring how you're doing, I think it's, in, it's important to, uh, you know, on the one side, um, use a lot of your own very, you know, con specific context uh, goal setting, but at other levels be able to uh, link it up to, uh, you know, what, what I heard uh, Dan say about London or or, um, you know, other, other, or what I, what I would hear from UNEP or UNESCO, which is connecting it up, you know, to your, to your peers, to the, 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 the city level, the regional level, the national level, and even the global level. And so you've got that dual, um, that dual, uh, you know, relationship. I think one thing I'll, I'll leave, I'll, I'll finish with one comment about um, artificial intelligence and big data um it where it, it turns out that actually um you know the, the best data you can harvest and leverage is actually your your own data i mean the data that your own operations or your own uh, organization is using and has access to uh rather than perhaps public or you know other other data so think about leveraging uh you know the the, the, the measurements and the monitoring uh, and the evaluation that you you have already or you have yourself and seeing how much you can use that in your in these um, best practice uh, laboratories okay great thank you very much travis we've got we've got a few minutes left um and there's i'm going to ask a, a couple of quick fire questions um and i'll i'll put these two together and i'll go around the panelists so cyan from india has asked uh, which is better, reusing uh, or recycling? And we've also got a question about how to integrate sustainability into education. So I'm going to start with you first, Dan. Maybe you could just give a, a quick response to those two, or one, or both of those points. Okay, thanks. On, on the reuse or recycling, I think reduce. Um, I would say don't 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 have the waste in the first place. Um, but I suppose uh, re, 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 reuse would be better than recycling. Um, out of those two questions, but reduce. Every reduce. Reduce. Throw less away. There you go, Sam. Not only has your question been answered, it's been improved upon to uh, uh, reduce. And then if you can't reduce, reuse. And then if you can't reuse, recycle. Um, Bernard, maybe you next. I think the education and sustainability link is probably a, a good one for you to focus on. And I think you've also posted some. Uh, comments yep. uh, some links into the chat so people might be interested in uh, uh, using those and having a deeper exploration of what you're doing over to you bernard now integrating into education well it should be i would say this the simple thing for schools is that it should not just be a lesson at, on one afternoon it should be a school project that involves the community the parents the kids everyone um, there was a question about values, integrating the values of sustainability in, in teaching and learning. Uh, we are all for that. Uh, we, we work a lot with what's called the Earth Charter. It's been around for 20 years. It has a set of principles that uh, basically one of them, to simplify, one of the biggest principles is the question of respect, respect for one another, respect for the uh, community of greater life, the nature, what's around us, and basically values. You cannot teach values. You have to live values. So for teachers, it's to model those values, is to discuss those values and be open to interactions on those and be challenged on, you know, why, you know, why are we focusing on this? Uh, but it's all part of resilience, this resiliency uh, discussion. And it's also what has also come up is that it's the, uh, in a way, the more soft side of education that needs to be pushed forward, forward, the question of social emotional learning, the question of creativity, flexibility, 
uh, basically education should not be that, you know, after so many years of compulsory education, you need to get good grades to move on to the next level. Anyway, grades are, are, not, are not there to be uh, focused on. What we have to focus on is developing the individual and making sure each of us can face the challenges we are confronted with, as I said, more and more rapidly and, more, and being more and more complex. So that's yeah, how I put it. No, very good, very good, very good points, uh, Bernard. Um, and Secretary Alvaro, uh, where are you on the reduce, reuse, recycle? I think I can have a guess. Well, I also think it's, so, well, first about education, we just learned about reduce now. So it, it's always time, uh, a good time for learning something new, uh, as Dan just put it out. But it's also a cycle. So, it, of course, that you can try to reuse something for as long as it lasts, but then once it's broken or once you cannot reuse it anymore, then you should recycle. So we think, and we try, sometimes we think about things as one or the other one, but the thing is that things can work together and everything has its own time. So you should start with reducing, as Dan said, then you reuse it as much as you can. And then once you have no use for that anymore, or you, blow, you broke your, your, your glass, for instance, then you should recycle it. So that's the way to do it. So things right. are not always uh, one or the other. They are not always excluded. Uh, we are not binary human beings. So we can work with more than one option at the same time. Brilliant. So uh, I'm going to bring this to a close now and I'm going to invite our panelists just for a very, very brief last word in terms of uh, what they take away from this conversation. And I think, um, you know, it's been very wide ranging. I, I think we've broken down the uh, unit of climate action into the city and we've seen what can be done in uh, collaborating and working together and having a long term vision about where we can take a city. Uh, and I think we've also linked that to the importance of education and learning. Um, and I, I think we need to recognize that everybody needs to keep learning all the time, and particularly as we face some of these systemic challenges uh, around uh, climate change and building resilient cities for the future. So I'm gonna start with you, Travis, very brief, just a couple of uh, words really before we close out. Um, uh, and uh, and leave everybody to get on with uh, with more of the discussions that they're having in in these debates. Travis, over to you. Oh, thanks, James. I think I think it's about really it's what's been said about ex executing sustainable solutions at the local level. And I mean, from a, as a, as a technologist, um, that's what we want to see as well. And it's getting those uh, making sure those are connected at a cross sectoral at a platform level from a, for the technology. But it's really about executing those those solutions uh, locally, and let's see more and more of that, and how we live and learn and uh, expand. Thanks. Great, D Dan. Sorry, to come off on mute. Um, yeah, so I think the key thing for me is to take good practice, and, and Lewis has talked about some really good stuff he's doing in San Paulo, and and learn from that, and then make it better. I think. That would be Brilliant, Bernard. Yeah, <laughs> I think it's uh, looking at all these interconnections that we've been talking about interlinkages and seeing different entry points for learning and, and educating ourselves and our fellow people within a city. And Secretary Alvaro, the final word uh, to you. That's a huge responsibility. <laughs> I think that uh, it's very hard to change cultural habits, uh, like the way we consume, like the way we discard. So the, the, the teaching and learning process should be an everyday uh, effort that everyone, everybody has to do, not only in schools like Bernard said. And, and of course, that we got to do what we are doing now. We need to collaborate internationally. Uh, we need the country's responsibility. We need to act as one planet, as home of all of us. But we should not forget the responsibility that is on, upon the mayor's shoulders. Because everything that is decided globally or in the countries, it will be implemented in the cities because that's where we live, that's where we consume, and that's where we discard. Brilliant. Thank. I mean, I think that is a, it's a great final word. And so it just leaves me to thank our panelists, uh, Dan, Bernard, Secretary Alfaro, Travis, uh, for really a wide ranging, uh, interesting, I feel as though I've learned a lot from this discussion and, 
Um, hopefully all of you in the audience have too. I'd like to thank you in the audience for your engagement on the chat and for some of the great questions that you've asked. And uh, I'd also like to thank um, the people behind the scenes who make sure this all works uh, technologically. So Eva, Clara and Carl, uh, thank you very much indeed. And uh, good luck with the rest of the programme and good luck in uh, educating yourselves and being great sustainable warriors in the cities and making them the places to live in the future. Thanks, everybody. And see you all again soon. Ciao. Bye. Bye.